So in this episode, we want to think back to our weeks together and our episodes and the subjects that we've already talked about. And so if you look at the picture that you have on the screen, uh, you have uh, creation in the upper left. There's Michelangelo's God creating the sun, the moon, and the heavens. You have a Greek idea of the order of the universe. You have uh, Moses, the story of the Exodus. You have a little uh, piece of the document. It's the oldest fragment of the uh, New Testament. You have uh, questions about the Bible. Down the lower left, there's Abraham and Isaac. Now, all these are pieces of the synthesis that is slowly coming together in this first century AD, the time of Paul, that we have been talking about in these episodes. So slowly, the Greek-speaking, Latin-speaking, Hebrew-speaking, a mixture of Christian, Jew, Roman citizen, Greek citizen, all of these people were thinking through in the first century and second century and third century how those different pieces come together. And by the time of Augustine, which is the subject of our next set of episodes, by the time of Augustine, that synthesis has been created. Those men who live around the year 400 know what these pieces are. Augustine knows Cicero. Augustine reads Cicero in Latin, and he loves Cicero. And the other men who help create the synthesis also love the great Roman writers and love the great Greek writers. So this group around the year 400 is thinking all of these pieces and bringing them back and writing it down, writing it down in documents that we have. So what we're looking at in this picture, in this panel, is everything coming together. So that's where we are. We're in week 10, and everything is coming together of what we've studied for 10 weeks. And so, so what are these things? What are the things that come out now from the Jews, the Christians, the Greeks, and the Romans and coming together and will come together in week 11 with Augustine? Talk about someone who consciously is trying to consciously bring this together. That's the story. So here is what it's all about. So the first thing that there is an order to the universe. So we've had this in front of us since our first night. There is an order to the universe, whether it's the Genesis order or the Greek philosophical cosmos order, the Pythagorean order with geometry. It's all the same. It all comes together. And the quote from Steven Weinberg says, you know, a couple of years ago, in all my experience as a physicist, this leads me to believe that there's an order in the universe as we have been going to higher and higher energies and as we've studied structures that are smaller and smaller, he means the gene, we have found that the laws, the phys physical principles that describe what we learn become simpler and simpler. The rules we have discovered become increasingly coherent and universal. There's a simplicity, a beauty that we're finding in the rules that govern matter that mirrors something that is built into the logical structure of the universe. So there you go, that's it. And if we look at this, which of course is the Greek cosmos, and we look at Genesis right over there, it says in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. And if we notice the opening of the gospel according to John, the opening line is, in the beginning was the word he uses is logos, which equals order, which shows you the merging together of the Greek and the Judeo-Christian idea. Christians are merging the philosophical order of Logos with the creation story of the Jews and then adding the salvation preaching of Jesus. So that's the first thing. There's an order to the universe. The second, and if we just look at this image that I love so much, the suspension bridge, which is a Western civilization, you can see it's a picture of exactly what we have here. We have the Greeks in their order and we have the Judeo-Christian on the other and they have to be constantly held together. It's just like a suspension bridge. It's in suspense. So the second thing 
that comes out of all of this is you are important. You, individual, human being, male, female, are important in this great, huge, vast universe. You have a place and you have a purpose. You're not just, I don't know how to spell jetsam, but I spell flotsam and jetsam. So we're not just a lot of mud that sprang to life, but that you are special, you're human, you're part of the great human tradition of, of life, dignity, uniqueness. You are important. And here's that issue of Christianity again, the discovery, quote, discovery of Christianity of the individual. It doesn't mean that we discovered it. It means we just made it important. That's all. That, that now suddenly individuals are very important. Number three, and this is a great one, and I love it because it's so true, you can do it. That is, all this pressure and all this demand of all these things you're going to have to do uh, to fulfill your role, you can do it because you have community with you. And this is both a Greek idea, it's Aristotelian, Aristotelian, Aristotle in his book on politics says specifically, human beings are social animals. We can't live outside of the community. And Cicero agrees 100%, Ciceronian essays make the same point. And so does all of the Christian preaching, that what you are and what you can do is what it is because you have a whole community around you and the entire tradition of Judeo-Christian and future. So you can do it. Number four, I told you, things are getting better. I know this is hard to believe, but, but things are getting better. Time is progress in, in this vision. This vision says that in time, from Abraham all the way to present, 4,000 years, things are getting better. We can point to specific things Elimination of slavery, Magna Carta, Bill of Rights, lots of things. We can point to a lot of things that show you things are getting better, and you're part of it. What you do will advance. I put up the, the clocks because, as most of you know, clocks are distinctly Western and distinctly Western Civ and distinctly European, and they all appear about the same time, time of Dante, and Francesco Petrarca will talk about that is about 1350, all over Europe, starting in Italy. But all of a sudden, everybody has clocks. So just all of a sudden, people all over Europe, and then, of course, later people imitate it, but Europe first, everybody cares about the time. All of a sudden, everybody cares about the time. What time is it? What hour is it, is what they're saying. What hour? There's no, there's no minute hand at first. And there are all these wonderful clocks in Italy, of course, the beautiful one, that's Venice. It had one of the most, and still has it, still there. The one in the upper right corner is, is in Verona, and it's right up over the Piazza of Dante, where Dante is standing. It's, of course, a statue of Dante. The real Dante is not standing there. Uh, <laughs> he would be very tired by now if he were still standing there. And the other one is Cremona. They're just, they're magnificent clocks. They're all over northern Italy, 13 to 1400. Hundreds of them, and cities spent immense fortunes to get the best clockmaker in the world to come. Why? Because all of a sudden, everybody started caring about time. How much time was there, and what time of the day was it? And soon they were going to have watches. Later, they invent watches. And then they invent watches with second hands. So step by step by step, we have become more curious. And then you get your little digital watches with, you know, Seconds of seconds of seconds, nanoseconds. So things are getting better. Time is transformed, and time is good. It will reveal God's plan, a happy vision, things getting better. It's not the dark view of the Greeks that everything was the same forever and ever and ever. This is a happy view. We're going to send you home happy tonight, upbeat, very happy and very upbeat. Now, final question everybody in this room is asking, so what's it all about? Where is it going, and what do we do? What's the plan all about? Well, it's very simple. Here is Paul writing about it. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on having its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things, and it never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect knowledge comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And then when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, as a grown-up adult person, I see better and I see through a glass darkly. But someday, we will all see face to face the truth. Now I know only a part, but someday I will know all and understand all, even as I and we have been understood in this world. So faith, hope, And love abide. But the greatest of these is love. And note that John puts it at the cornerstone of everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. So that's love that moves the universe. And Matthew gives the account in Matthew 22 again when someone asks Jesus, well, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and the second is unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody in this room knows these commandments. You all have heard, love your neighbor as yourself. So, if we look back at these five things, it's very clear. You are important. You're part of an orderly world. There's a goal of the world. The goal is to expand love and to love one another as yourself. 